open your Bibles today to the book of 3rd John. The book of 3rd John, we began this last week and preached through the first couple of verses of this. And so we're going to read down this morning through verse 8 in this particular book. 3rd John, we will read again the introduction in verses 1 and 2 and read down through verse 8 again today. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who bore witness of your love before the church. You send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. So we introduced this writing of the Apostle John. We do believe it was written by John uh, as he wrote the Gospel of John and 1 John and 2 John, we believe that this was written by uh, John. Really, the difference in this letter, as we said last week, is this is a more personal letter. He wrote it to a particular person, a man by the name of Gaius. And we went back into the uh, different scriptures and Acts and some of the uh, epistles even of the Apostle Paul where we believe that Gaius most likely was identified as, a, as an early convert. Uh, and so he was a beloved one of John. Uh, and he says, whom I know the truth there, as he stated last week, this was one that held to the truth that John taught. I think particularly concerning those things that John had written concerning uh, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we've said before, it does matter what we believe about Jesus Christ, that He is the eternal Son of God, that He is deity, that He came in incarnate, incarnate flesh, that He died upon the cross, He shed His blood, He died, and that He rose again and He sits at the right hand of the Father. It matters what you believe about Christ. And then, of course, John wrote about those things concerning the salvation of the Christian life, particularly at length there in 1 John. I think that this was, these were other truths that Gaius had heard and that he held to also. She said, I love him in the truth. And then he gives a common greeting there in verse 2 where he speaks of beloved. He uses that word beloved as we have said before that that is a word where the word of God is used, that these are ones loved of God. He was a brother in Christ. And so he, he gives him, he gives this opening here. He says, I pray, or I desire, really what that means, that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. And again, as we relayed last week, uh, that uh, we spoke of, of this at some length, that as in our day and time, many have, I think, taken this verse out of context to say that, well, God wants everybody to be wealthy. He wants everybody to be healthy. Of course, as we know, that's not scripturally true. That uh, that that uh, we find in the scriptures, those that are ill, that are believers. The apostle Paul himself had a thorn in the flesh uh, that he prayed to the Lord three times for for the Lord to take that away, and uh, he did not take it away, but said, "I'll give you my grace instead. My grace is sufficient for you." And for those that would say, "Well, God wants all Christians to be healthy," I would say to you the words of what Jesus said, the foxes uh, have their holes and the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And uh, Paul talks about, I've learned in all things, whatever state I'm in, whether I have plenty or I don't have plenty, uh, that uh, to be content in those things. But his desire here was that as a fellow laborer with Christ, the fellow believer, he did desire, I want you to, I want you to have plenty. I, I desire that you be in health, and just as your soul prospers. He was healthy spiritually. And he says, I want you, I hope and pray that, that you are prosperous in these other things. And so we come to verses 3 and 4 here. Really, these go together, so I'm going to treat these basically as one statement here. Uh, he talks about here, I rejoice greatly 
When brethren came to testify the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now, I think that, that John speaks to him much the same as maybe the Apostle Paul did to some of the uh, churches that he wrote to. That in a sense, he was a spiritual father to this one. Maybe Gaius uh, had had a close relationship with John. Uh, maybe he had sat under the ministry of John for some time before. But, but I think that there is a sense in which those that uh, are pastors and teachers... Uh, over a congregation, and as we have here in, in the New Testament, these apostles, that they have a certain, uh, a great love for these here. There's a great connection there that they have with them. I remember uh, in my studies, or I found in my studies, the statement by uh, the Apostle Paul where he talked about this kind of spiritual connection with those. Uh, that, that he, uh, you know, he had a great love for those that they had been birthed really through the preaching of the gospel that he preached. If you go back to 2 John chapter, uh, well, only one chapter, 2 John verse 4 there, uh, again, John had repeated this statement that I rejoice greatly that I have found of your children walking in truth. Uh, he had a great joy, he had a great sentiment here that they, he was rejoicing that they walked in the truth. And this was the joy and the rejoicing of John's heart. Uh, that the truth that he had taught Gaius was still being reflected in his life. Uh, he had obedience to the truth. And then I believe that there was this, we talked about practical sanctification going on in his life. He was growing in holiness. He was being obedient to those things that were commanded in the Scriptures. And he said, I, you know, I, I rejoice greatly. And the brethren came and they testified that this truth, they saw this truth in you. Uh, again, true Christianity uh, is seen in that His people uh, believe the truth of God uh, taught by John and really by first by Jesus that they hunger for the truth of God as we see, as we've talked about in Psalm 1 over there uh, about the righteous man there and his desire that he has for the Word of God. And we talked we talk about it and noted many scriptures in Psalm 119 there about the psalmist talking there about uh, how he hungers for the Word of God. And these that he's talking about here that he rejoices greatly about him being in the truth, he also, I think, there was seen in him that there was this sanctification. There was this holiness. There was this walking in the truth. There was this pursuing after Christ. I mean, and Christ talked about this. Now, if you go back over to the to the book of John, and many of these truths, as I've said before, that we find in 1 John, are things that we find in the Gospel of John that were first taught by Christ. And Christ said in John 14, in verse 6, Jesus said, you know, speaking to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Then if you move on farther down there in that particular chapter, what does Jesus say? He points to Himself, I'm the truth. You follow me, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. If you're going to have eternal life, then you follow me. But also if you're going to follow me, if you're going to say that you love me, He says in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father. He will give you another helper that He may buy with you forever the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him for He dwells with you and will be in you. Now how do we know what the truth is? Well, because of the Spirit of truth. God gives to His people the Spirit of truth. He gives to them the Spirit, Holy Spirit who indwells all of His people. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul says. And if our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and God has given us His Spirit, then when truth, when we read truth, when we hear truth taught and preached, that resonates, I believe, with the soul of the people of God. And it is not burdensome to follow after the commandments of Christ. 
It is not burdensome to pursue after holiness and sanctification and the things of God. Those things are the rejoicing of our heart. Those things are the, the, what the soul of the believer desires. He wants truth. Nothing else will satisfy his soul like truth. That's what he does. And you go farther on here in John, in John chapter 15, in verse 14, Jesus said, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Those that follow after the truth are going to do whatever the one who says I am the truth, whatever he commands. They're going to want to do those things. They're going to want to please him. But also not just in the writings of uh, the words of Jesus and the writings of John, but also if you look at, at 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, the Apostle Peter talks about this, this what is seen in the lives of the children of God and how they pursue truth and what is the evidence of that, that truth is important to them. In 1 Peter chapter 1, and there verses 13 through 16, Peter writes this, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And so the ones that are pursuing truth are going to pursue holiness. That's right. I've met people that say, Well, I believe the truth. But it's not reflected in, the, in, in what they're pursuing in their lives. Sin shall no longer have dominion over us. We will pursue holiness, those of the truth. And then again, uh, in 1 John in chapter 2, in verses 3 through 6, what was it that John taught back then? But now by this we know. You say, well, you ask people, say, do you know the Lord? Oh, yes, I know the Lord. Well, how do you know that you know the Lord? So, well, I, I, I made a profession of faith and I prayed a prayer and I got baptized, so I, I know. Well, how does John say that we know that we know Him? By this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He who says I know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. And the truth, the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps his word, in other words, whoever keeps his truth, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So you see, the brethren came to John and they said, This man, is, he, is, he is walking in the truth. And his heart rejoiced over that. That was a joy of his heart. He said, oh yes, this one that I have that taught him is, is a beloved of mine. He's walking in the truth. Let me say this. One of the greatest burdens and sorrows of a pastor's heart and soul is when <coughs> members of his congregation stray from the path of truth. Mm -hmm. And they stray away from the Lord. Stray into disobedience of the Word of God. And away from the fellowship of the people of God. When they God had said, you know, you have people that, that turn their backs on the truth of God's Word or turn their backs on the church and say it's not important to them anymore. Remember in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, Paul said, Demas has forsaken me. Had him love this present world. And that happened. That's a heartbreaking thing for a pastor. But the greatest joy is to see those whom he has pastored and labored in the Word for walk in the truth. He says that. What? He says, I have no greater joy. That is the joy of the pastor. That is the joy of those who has a flock under his charge is to see people that he has labored in the word for, that he has sacrificed basically his life for, to walk in the truth. 
I think about as I, as I studied this and you think, well, where is the connection here? In 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Remember, this is not about romantic love. This is about God's love. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, the first part of that says, love suffers long and is kind. Then you go down to verse 6. He says here, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. You see, the pastor, and like John does, rejoices in seeing not iniquity in the life of his people, but rejoices in seeing truth in the lives of his people. Yes. Sanctification in the pursuit of holiness in the lives. This is our reward. This is our rejoicing. As he says here, to see that you walk in the truth. And it is for the pastor. It is to see those that they, that they have preached to and taught the Word to walking in that truth of God's Word. So then he goes on down here to verse 5. He says here, Beloved, and he's speaking here again to guys, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. Hmm. Now here John is commending Gaius for his hospitality toward both believing brothers in Christ and for strangers. Now, are the strangers he's talking about here, are these strangers that are believers? Probably so, given the context. Maybe not, though, because we really are to be kind to all and loving toward all. But John spoke of in, in 2 John of... of in, we need to think back on this. He spoke in 2 John of not showing hospitality to, toward those who were heretic, heretics. Remember that? He said, don't give them. If you have somebody that comes and doesn't hold the doctrine of Christ, he said, do not wish them well. Do not invite them into your house. Do, let them, do not let them take advantage of your hospitality. But in this we see that he says you do faithfully you do for the brethren and for strangers. We are, uh, John notes here, especially Gaius, he commends him for his love that he shows faithfully. He's faithful in showing hospitality to these believers. Now let me say this, that this was very important in that day and time. Because as these traveled, uh, doing the work of the church, preaching the gospel, uh, there weren't a lot of what you would call hotels along the way. There weren't any holiday inns or comfort inns or those kind of places around. And the places where you could stay didn't have a very good reputation. And very many times these that traveled depended upon the hospitality of fellow believers to take them into their home to show them hospitality, to feed them, to give them a roof over their head in their travels and in their ministry. And may I say this, that this is still an important thing, I think, as far as believers, that we are to show hospitality toward other believers. Uh -huh. We ought to be very open-hearted. Mm -hmm. Recall back in 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, where we were talking about some of these things. Talking about this agape love. John said, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And this was a way in which uh, guys were showing his love in deed and in truth as, as these came through and as they traveled, as they went uh, preaching the gospel that he took them into his home. He showed hospitality to them. And in the book of James, it talks about the same thing over in chapter 2, uh, verses 14 through 18. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and none of you says to, him, to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So again, God was showing his faith uh, in that he was hospitable toward these. He showed the evidence of his love. He showed the evidence of his faith in his care for the brothers and sisters in Christ and even also 
uh, for strangers. Also for strangers. It's interesting. I don't know how many of you have, uh, know this verse of Scripture over in Hebrews 13 and 2 to entertain strangers for some have entertained angels unaware. Right. You say, well, how will I know? Well, you don't know. <laughs> There used to be this, this TV show on years ago called Touched by an Angel. You know. I hope you didn't get your theology from it. Because, it was, uh, because she would always announce on there and say, oh, well, I, I'm an angel sent from God. Well, an angel, if he's sent by God to us, he doesn't announce himself. Because the glory is to go to God. That's right. In that. But we do, and Caius was, was uh, commended by John for entertaining the strangers. Then in verse 6 he says, Who have borne witness of your love before the church, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. So Caius' hospitality toward others had been testified of by the brothers before the whole church. They've gone back and said, This is a true brother. He has taken care of us. He has shown hospitality to us. He is, he is just radiates the love of Christ through how He has treated us. You know, sometimes I think we're, we're mistaken that we only think about those people that we, in our mind, have done great things for God that will be recognized by others and by God. You know, we, we think about people like Newton that wrote Amazing Grace. We think about, wow! What great things he did for God by writing those hymns. And we think about somebody like Charles Spurgeon, uh, perhaps, or Jonathan Edwards, that, that, that God used greatly. Man, surely, you know, <coughs> those are the kind of things that God will recognize us for or others for. But, think about this. Here, all that Gaius did was show hospitality. That's all he did. He took people into his home. Guess what? 2,000 years later, people still know about it. Mm -hmm. 2,000 years later, we're still reading about guys showing hospitality and being faithful to God and being faithful to the truth and showing the love of God for others in the Scriptures. This simple act of hospitality. And we read you know, the Scriptures <coughs> this morning. Did we not over there in... In, in Matthew chapter 25 about, you know, that as we show this hospitality, as we do these things for others, that that will be recognized by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says there in Matthew chapter 25. Now it's not just that that act earns us salvation, but those that have salvation, that have the love of God poured out within them, they have a desire to do that their lives. I remember, I don't know if all of you know this, but many, many, many years ago, when I was a young man, I went one year to, to seminary, to Baptist Seminary down in Jacksonville, Texas. And uh, there was a little church about 100 miles from there that they wanted me to pastor, and I didn't really pastor. I just drove down there and preached on Sundays. It was a long journey. I had to get up early Sunday morning, drive down there. I remember there was this old saintly woman. I wish I could remember her name. Uh, it's been too long ago. My memory's not what it used to be. But every Sunday, she took me home to church, after church, and fed me and me. Every Sunday. She was hard as good. <laughs> but I remember her love. She loved having the pastor in her home, taking care of his physical needs. And it was a joy. It was a joy to do that. And I thought, I thought about that as I, was, as I was doing this study. I thought about that lady. Uh, and many of us, uh, in times in our lives, there may have been people that they didn't have a great talent for the Lord, like that couldn't preach, that couldn't teach. They can serve. They can wait on tables. They can serve God's servants and God's people and missionaries. You see, as Jesus said, even giving a cup of cold water will be 
it will be rewarded. And here, what Gaius did was worthy of testimony. And it still is. And he says here, he uses the term here, in a manner worthy of God. Now, let me say, say something, folks. That goes in all different realms. We ought to do our work daily in a manner worthy of God. We ought to speak to our neighbors in a manner worthy of God. Our service that we do in the church should always be in a manner worthy of God. To think about it in the aspect that this, we are representing we are His child. When I speak, do others hear God reflected in my speech? When they see my work, do they see God in me? When I show hospitality, do they see God? It should be, as He says here, in a manner worthy of God. We are to treat them in a manner as God would treat them. And He says, you will do well. Doing these things, we are doing well in the eyes of God. And God, John's encouragement here was to, for Gaius to continue showing hospitality. Can you imagine Gaius receiving this letter and, 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 the, and the encouragement that it gave him to know that, that John, you know, that others were speaking of that? Not, not that that's why he was doing it, but it's an encouragement. It was an encouragement to him. And, and it, was a, it was a great part of his testimony. And it should be a great part of our testimony also. Then we come to verse 7. And he said, speaking of those that had been sent on the floor, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. John is noting here that these who, whom Gaius showed hospitality toward were doing so for the sake of the gospel. They were likely preachers or evangelists sent out by the churches for the spreading of the gospel. I mean, was this not ordained by Christ? The Great, great Commission is, as we know it over in, in uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Go ye therefore to all the world, preaching the gospel, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded, uh, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the ages. And so it was carried out by the churches. And we see over in Acts 13 uh, how that, that, I believe it was Antioch, that sent out uh, Paul and Barnabas out to preach the gospel. This is, I believe, the biblical pattern. The churches uh, should be sent, uh, pastors and evangelists should be sent out by churches. We ought to participate in the sending out of those God has called to preach the gospel. There's plenty, there's plenty of places to go that need the gospel in this day and time. Might I say it, given the, the state of our own nation, that we do well to start in the United States of America. You don't have to go overseas to find a place that needs preaching. That's right. But we ought to participate in the sending out of those that God has called. God has called. And, you know, we don't, what we call often encounter now, traveling, I think the word is itinerant, evangelist in our day. But we do have, as a church and as believers, the opportunity to faithfully support missions. We have several different missionaries that we support in this church. And we ought to do that. You ought to, be, you ought to love them enough and love souls enough that you participate in that faithfully. We even, you know, collect cans. Recycle cans and send that money to the missionaries. Now, it's not usually a whole lot of money. Maybe $15, $20, something like that, $25, and then you put a free will offerings on top of that also to go to the missionaries. But you think $15 or $20 doesn't do much here. We'll take you and your wife out to eat, brothers. But it'll do a lot in these places that are poverty stricken. It will do a lot for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ought to do this so that the name of Christ would be lifted up in the preaching of the gospel. 
And he said here, taking nothing from the Gentiles. What did he mean by that? Well, he, he meant that they did not ask for any support or help in the world. We don't ask for support from the world. We don't ask for help from the world, from those outside of Christ in the proclamation of the gospel. But they depended, as we see scripturally, they depended upon the churches and they depended upon the <coughs> other believers. You know, and, and Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 8. And I'm not going to go into all of that, but in those first 15 verses there, he said how that even their liberality was exceeded, came out of even, they were in a state of poverty, but they gave liberally for the cause of the gospel so that Paul could go and preach the gospel in places. And that's the way that we, that we ought to do. Sometimes we need to examine, I think, and I think it's a very uh, good thing for us periodically as believers to examine how we spend our money. Are we investing it in eternal things? In those things that are eternal, when we invest our money in the preaching of the gospel and missions and in places where we know those men are faithfully serving the Lord Jesus Christ and preaching the truth of the gospel of grace, let me tell you something. We, that we're going to reap eternal dividends. Yes. In that. Amen. We need to look at that. And then... John says there, we therefore, in verse 8, we therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. I believe that John's urging here really is more not just to Gaius, but for others that might read this letter also. Gaius' participation in helping these on the journey was a participation in the gospel ministry. You see, when you give your dollars. Oh, Brother Weber, we don't need to talk about money. <laughs> it takes money mm -hmm. to make the gospel go out. For a church to function like this. If the church didn't function, the missionaries would not have their support. But as the money comes in, guess what? The gospel goes out. Hey. Souls hear the gospel. They hear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in places that otherwise they would have never even heard His name. God sovereignly uses means for the proclamation of the gospel. We can't all teach. We can't all preach. But we can all, from the youngest to the oldest, from the poorest to the most wealthy, we can be partakers and be fellow workers in the truth and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope and I pray that you have this kind of love in your heart for the laborers of the gospel that guides you. You may not be able even to have preachers in your home, to come stay in your home, to live in your home, but there are ways in which you can show hospitality to these, to other believers that will be a testimony of the love of God, of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and will be a proclamation of the gospel of God also. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the testimony of Gaius today. We thank you that John wrote this letter to this faithful servant of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this testimony. I pray Lord, today, that we would be faithful in our love toward other believers, our hospitality toward other believers, our support, Lord, in whatever way that we can of supporting the truth and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that, that the Word of God that has been preached today would, would come into our hearts and into our minds that we would be obedient to those things that have been taught. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the, the Spirit of God that takes the Word of God and, and, and speaks to us. And we pray, Lord, that throughout this week we would remember the Word of God and take it into our minds as we go day by day into the places that You are named for us to be. Father, I pray that everyone here this morning that knows Christ will be a faithful fellow laborer of the Gospel this week. 